Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I am a product design researcher, or design researcher. And today I'm here to share uh, my story, my experience over the last 10, 15 years in bio-based material design. I'm acting at the intersection of product design, material science, engineering, social sciences, humanities, many disciplines. And this also explains why I ask these collaborative questions, and I will try to answer my own question during my presentation, actually. Uh, in 2015, I founded the group Materials Experience Lab uh, with my colleague Valentina Ronioli from Politecnico Milano. It's a cross-country research group, so we brought our researchers, PhDs, postdocs together to explore the materials experience as a notion. And what I mean by materials experience, I will also explain now, within a moment. With an example, and I like this example because it really explains uh, my role in collaborative material development. After my PhD in 2009, which was about meanings of materials, exactly, literally the title of my thesis, um, my work attracted industry attention. Material developers approach me to really support the material development to understand why people think a certain material is natural, high quality, friendly, cozy. So why we think materials have these meanings? This was one of the companies from Holland. They were developing this bioplastic packaging from PLA for many years. Very successful, actually, a line of product that I had production but they wanted to make a change. They said, we want another production line. So they decided to make another product, which was for totally uh, for another market. They made a coffin, bioplastic coffin. And apparently, it was a very difficult industry to get in. You needed to get a certificate. It was not easy to make a plastic coffin, bioplastic coffin, and immediately put it in the market. It took them quite a lot of time to get the certificate, and after two years' time, they couldn't even sell one coffin. It was in the old brochures of coffin, but no one really wanted. And they asked me, Alvin, what's the reason? Help us to understand how we can make this coffin sell, or why people do not want a plastic, bioplastic coffin. Because it's a fantastic application area for the material, because it can dissolve under the ground after six months, and it is lightweight, it's truly sustainable. It has many qualities that really made them to believe that this context was a fantastic context for this material. But they didn't consider one thing only, people. You know, what people think, what they want. It was such a risky, risky context, but they took the risk and it didn't work. Of course, my first answer was about the design of the coffin. Of course, you could definitely design it, you know, and it was obvious that they didn't involve a product designer in the project. Uh, but other than that, I had many answers to, to give. And first of all, we needed time to explore, you know, what is the meaning of this material here? And I explain all these people-material relationships with the notion of materials experience, which I introduced in 2009 in my thesis when I completed. And I emphasize the active role of materials in shaping our internal dialogues with artifacts. And later on, in 2015, with my colleague Elisa Jacardi, we introduced another level in our experience, which was the way of doing. So materials role in shaping our ways of do doing and behavior in daily life. What I mean by that, that I would like to explain a little further with an example. When we look at this example, Soft Light by Simone Framba, um, it is a rubber-like material. So it's a different type of lighting. We can really feel it that it is soft. And when we are asked to describe in daily life, let's say, we could say that, wow, it has the soft qualities. I can play with it. It's playful, right? And I can really put it in different contexts I can use it in different situations. And this is all because of its material qualities embodied in this form. And whatever this experience is, that we always experience materials in four levels. The first level is sensorial. 
all these descriptions that I give about soft, hard, transparent, smooth, all in the sensory level, so what we sense. The second level is interpretive. It's about what we think. It's about the meanings. So we think that they are cozy, friendly, high-tech. And the third level is affective, which is what materials makes us, uh, how materials makes us feel. We love certain materials. We hate some. Or they surprise us. And the fourth level is performative level. So materials makes us act in different ways. I will show what I mean in different cases and how we kind of use different levels in the design of materials and products. In, in my slides, I will use uh, as a background projects from our lab, from our students, from our PhDs. Some of them I will explain, some of them not, but they are very interesting projects. And if you would like to hear more about it, of course, you can visit, visit our website that you will see that who, who is behind these projects. For example, this one is from uh, product design students from my Italian partners, Politecnico Milano, and they use West textiles and they make marble-like materials. And in all these projects, you will see that product design is the lead. Product designers are trying to really shape the material, and they are bringing the ideas for ingredients to make materials. But how we design for bio-based material experiences what has been done so far to date, and what should be the next? When we look at the history of bio-based material experiences and how this experience thinking has been included or embedded in the bio-based material development, uh, we can talk about two things. One is naturalistic dimension, I will explain, and one, the other one is what I call typicality dimension. And with the examples, I will bring this question of tempor temporal and performative dimension, which, in my opinion, should be the next, what we will be looking for. Let's talk about a little bit the naturalistic dimension. It's all about the tension between natural and synthetic qualities that we're talking. And so far, in all collaborative material development projects that I was involved, the main question from material developers was, how we can really uh, make this material look more natural. Because actually they are coming from natural sources. But are they really natural? So this was always the question that we were having. And, and usually, when we look at in many daily products, we prefer scratch-free, slick materials. There has been a lot of studies in design research about that. We really like smooth surfaces, we like scratch-free, and this is usually how material development takes naturalness in the process of material development, let's say, because they want to make this very perfect scratch-free materials. But grounding on the theories of human affiliation and preference for the natural, for many other things, we prefer natural. We prefer natural food, for example. And a lot of design scholars advocate these imperfect material features for bio-based materials. So this, this, this is this conflict about natural, imperfect material qualities that come from design scholars and imper uh, very perfect, very scratch-free, slick materials from material development. I was one of the, of course, um, scholars that was interested in this in this dilemma, and I look at uh, how we can really understand and what is the ex exact thing between these natural and synthetic qualities. And if you would like to really express naturalness in a material, bio-based material development, what we can do. Uh, I don't present the entire study here, but just before this study, um, I conducted another one, and I look at when people think a material exactly is natural. So what are the qualities in materials that affect our uh, our experience with materials when we think that they are natural or synthetic. And there were two, three qualities that I found that were really key. Reflectiveness, fiberness, and roughness. And then, in very controlled settings, I varied these qualities in, in different types of products. For example, mobile phone covers, trays, and, and made user studies to have this kind of graphs so to really understand when do we think 
a material gets natural, then we play with these qualities, or, for example, high quality, and then try to understand these correlations between two. Of course, this kind of study, and you can find many studies like that, many other uh, colleagues, scholars made this kind of studies. They're very interesting, but still, they don't really answer the question of why we prefer and how we could really modify or mobilize these materials to express certain meanings. Because if we think that there is a scale between natural and synthetic, emerging biobased materials are in this gray area they are not really natural, they're not really synthetic. So maybe this is not exactly the right question that we need to ask. This is a designer, Shadar Livne. She's um, a designer in residence now with me mater in Materials Experience Lab. And she's exploring, uh, she made this material, very speculative material, a clay-like material from discarded plastics combined with mindstone. She's imagining a far future where we will mine plastics. And these materials are, are they natural or are they synthetic? And she's really exploring this meaning of natural and synthetic and in the future what we will think about that. So maybe the question is how natural and synthetic material qualities are mobilized and eliciting novel experiences. So maybe we, we should just forget about this natural and synthetic dilemma, but just focus on more novel experiences. So what are the qualities in these materials that we could use to elicit novel ones? So this brings me to the second dimension that I would like to talk about, which is the typicality dimension. Typicality, which is the tension between novel material, typical material versus novel material, typical application. So how we can introduce a novel material or emerging or novel for the society, maybe has been there for many years, but it's not really well known, in a really typical application or very top, uh, very novel application. Which one is, which one could be better? So this really, really question material uh, industries for many years, material developers. In this project, for example, uh, my graduation student, Yorit Takema, it was an old project in around 2013, um, we were working with uh, natural fiber composite developers and they were looking for the ways that we could really introduce this material, but they said that we don't want really something that you can industrially produce maybe, but we want an iconic product. Iconic product that can attract attention. It can really show the qualities of this material in a very unique way. In this product, he used only natural fiber composites as a structural element as well, because when you heat press, of course, the material gets really harder, and so he could really implement it in the design. So the cushion and the structure is made out of natural fiber composite from exact same material. And maybe it will not really be used, maybe it's not that comfortable as a feeling when you sit, although I said it's very comfortable, but still it was an iconic product to introduce the material. But is it the way to go? So this was exactly my question that I have been asking. So when we look at, for example, a very novel uh, examples from Eric Klarenberg and Marcia Droz uh, from Holland, and they are 3D printing with algae, algae. And, and as you see, they are really, it's a very difficult thing that they're doing, but they're making vases, cups with this 3D printing material. And a typical product, which is the degree to which a product represents a category, is often preferable to people. Wishing to avert risks inherent in ventures into the unknown. People like typical products, but to a certain extent. This is another algae product, which is a edible uh, water bottle. And the company is taking a risk. They are introducing a very novel product, a novel way of drinking water. But they're not that wrong, because when we look at, again, design literature, we can see that consumers prefer novel products when the newness and unfamiliarity can alleviate boredom effects. So they can really reduce boredom with that. So what is this, when we, the question to ask then, so I was really wondering, when we introduce a new material, so what are the strategies designers really follow when we include them? In a recent paper, which is in press in International Journal of Design, 
we explored this different ways the designer introduced materials, novel materials, and we grouped them under three categories. The first one is from Maurizio Montalti, mycelium-based materials, and he's using very archetypical objects, archetypical forms, and really like uh, you can only notice the material is different, but they're really vases, cups, that we can really see, archetypical objects, let's say. Susan Lee, she's using bacterial cellulose for making fashion garments, and but she's really replacing an existing material. Maybe the form is not archetypical, but she's, we can't hardly recognize maybe it's not a letter. She's really, really repeating, and she's using the material as a surrogate. And the third one that I say the hypothetical, there actually, maybe it's not yet possible, but designers are making a speculative um, presentation of the material, what it could be done with it. And these are all three ways, which is not wrong, which is perfect, because they introduce materials in different ways. They can reach to different societies, different groups. But maybe the question to ask, how to find this delicate balance between typicality and novelty when designing with new bio-based materials? So how we can decide to make new or very typical products and how we can balance that with the newness of the material? I believe that it's not that easy, and it requires really different disciplines come together and, and using different tools and methods from different disciplines. So I call it design for materials experience and use theories, tools, and methods from material science and engineering, as well as from social sciences and humanities. And in order to facilitate a design process where a material is the departure point, I developed with my colleagues a methodology where you can take the material and end with a material proposal or a product, including all these different discipline, tools from different disciplines. And designer is the leader in the project, but she, he's not, he or she is never alone. And the collaboration means it's not really uh, once in a while. So I have been involved also in European projects that only after six months we were coming together and sharing our results. This was not really the collaboration, but what really helped us. Designers were really frustrated because they couldn't really even understand the material. They couldn't have a, ha have a chance to really get the material and play with it. So the idea is really from the beginning, hand in hand, really around the table to discuss materials and to share experiences. And in order to facilitate this process, we developed many tools for different steps in the method. And uh, I will present some of them here with an illustrative case, one specific case. Over the last uh, five years, I have been involved in many projects like that, that we applied the material-driven design method. And you will see that they are not only bio-based materials, but they are even smart materials, electroluminescent like or recycled plastics. But I will present today one specific project, which is about mycelium-based materials. This was a collaborative project with um, Utrecht University, Professor Han Losten, microbiologist, who has been working for many years for mycelium-based materials, pure mycelium, but also mycelium-based composites. And Moritz de Montalti, Officina Corpus Coli designer, who has an experience with this material for 10 years. And Serena Camera, who was, the, who was my postdoc researcher in the project from Materials Experience Lab. So what happened, um, so the role of the design, designing with mycelium-based materials, so the aim of the project was materials is under development and how we can really accelerate this development with uh, the integrated understanding of product design. The first thing, of course, we do, a very proper benchmarking, right? First, we need to know, I very much liked the, actually the last quote uh, from the previous speaker, it was very nice, because it was about first read the whole book. So we do exactly in material design, first look what has been done. And as designers, it's a very um, uh, well-known, um, technique, of course, benchmarking. But material benchmarking is very interesting because it can take you to many other, other products. Maybe they are made of other materials, but they can inspire designers. So this is uh, how mycelium-based materials has been so far applied. Um, 
two examples that I will give. This is from Daniela Trope, uh, Mushle, Mushlum lampshade. Um, she developed this really big, huge uh, lampshade from mycelium. The second one is a very well-known company from USA, US. Uh, they are developing packaging, Ecovative. They are developing packaging from mycelium-based materials, wine packaging. And so we call this process material benchmarking and we collect this kind of uh, many projects like that. And we try to understand how designers in these projects uh, understood the material, what kind of qualities they wanted to bring forward. The second thing, of course, to do is actually these are all going in the first step of the method, which is understanding the material, and they all go in parallel. We make a representation or illustration of the material making process. Um, this was made by one of my graduation students, yeah. Devin Blauhoff. When she created this, the material scientists were really shocked. They were like, oh my god, we didn't do that before. It's a fantastic. So for us as designers, it's a very normal thing. The first thing that we do, we really visualize the process. What it happens. And we have seen in many presentations, actually yesterday and today, this is a very common practice in design. And she created this. The second thing, of course, we do create a material taxonomy. Material taxonomy to understand what are the variables that we can play with as a designer. So to what extent we have a control on the material and to what extent we need material scientists and to work on nano level. So and this is we don't do it alone. And this is again around the table to really understand uh, yeah, what are the what, what are we playing with. And this was again around the table with microbiologists, uh, material scientists, mechanical engineers and product designers really to understand, okay, these are the qualities that we can play with and create different qualities in the material. And then what we call this process, which is a long process, which is material tinkering. In material tinkering, we look at, um, of course, there has been a lot done by other designers or material scientists. But as a designer in the project, you need to really, really understand how they do, what they learned, and what I can discover new, maybe, in the process. So we combine, so in this one, um, Davin is trying to include other substrates to see how the material behaves. Because mycelium grows on natural, natural substrate, and so far in the composites we use sawdust, for example. And she was just questioning maybe, can it grow on coffee waste, for example. And she couldn't achieve, but later on, uh, a professor from UK, Carol Collette, she could achieve to grow mycelium on copper waste, for example. And these are really like, uh, and designers can, uh, can come up with this really bold, uh, bold assumptions. And sometimes when, when you have a really closely working material scientist, it can work. But you need to be in a conversation all the time. And then we carry this to systematic tinkering. Then we need to really pick certain qualities and vary in a controlled manner. And this is again from our group, uh, a PhD candidate, Stefano Parisi. In her graduation, in his graduation project, he did this. Of course, technical characterization. So as product designers, we need to understand how it performs. And I am actually in our faculty, we have three departments. One is industrial design, one is design engineering, one is systematic uh, strategic product design. And I'm under design engineering, and we have many tools, of course, to test the materials, to have mechanical tests. In this one, of course, we first needed to create samples that we could take it into the mechanical test. It was not that easy, very challenging. Of course, they were burning, so we tried many things, because you, of course, grow up the material. And, and this is not a common practice for design. It's totally different. And you need to really understand the material and how, how you can make the samples that you can test. And then, of course, we take it into test, how they behave. This was with the cotton. So in all, um, in all projects, uh, in all tests, so we varied certain qualities. And we played with the substrate, strain, and the strain, they were developed by the microbiology in Utrecht. So we were really changing, and we were seeing the, this effect, of course, on the mechanical behavior on the material. And here is cotton, you see. Three-point bending. 
And we are very excited about this paper. It will be the first one probably that's, uh, that really shows many strains and substrates at the same time that tried and also heat pressing. And we are very excited that actually the first author of this paper will be a designer, which is very nice. And then material scientists and microbiologists, chemical engineer, mechanical engineer, and they are co-authors and we are all together in this paper. The next step, of course, to create a material demonstrator. So the, the samples or demonstrators or uh, the pieces that we created, you cannot take them directly to the user studies because you need to show a little more than what it is. And material demonstrator is used in literature a lot. And in all the studies, we create material demonstrators to show different qualities at the same time. They are not really products and products, but they are not also 2D samples. They're just in between, just to give a more idea about the material. And we take them to what I call experiential characterization. In experiential characterization, you ask people to experience, to interact with the material. And you try to understand how their interaction change and how it happens in four levels. And in order to support that, we develop many tools over the years. And, and last year, we brought these tools together to really understand material experience in four levels in user studies. And this tool, particularly, we develop for designers in material-driven design projects and also for material developers, because it's a very agile tool that you could really easily adapt in a user study. Of course, we, one of the studies, in one of the user studies, for example, we, um, we try to classify the material, uh, how people recognize it, whether they think that it's wood, or it's a natural material, and we make this kind of studies. And we use usually products in the end to really see the overall effect when the material is embodied and how their understanding of the material change, their thoughts change, their feelings change. So we try to really capture these experiences in user studies. And the very difficult step comes. Of course, these are really, uh, so I'm really presenting as if it's a very like uh, easy process, very fast, but it takes a really long time to really create the samples and move ahead. And we come to a point, which is the second step of the methodology, material driven design, that the designer needs to create a materials experience vision, which is a difficult thing because you need to reflect on what has been done, what you found, and what other things so you need to merge this all to bring a unique quality forward in the final application. I would like to read um, the designer's vision, that how she created her vision and how she could articulate it. It can grow into any shape. It has high insulation and protection qualities. It can be composted and it makes you pluck and pick. The urge to break the material when interacting with it triggers the material to be something that is made to be crumbled and thrown away. So in user studies, she was constantly seeing people trying to pluck and pick the material, trying to break and destroy it. Very interesting. So this is the performative level that I was talking about. This was really inviting people to do that. She said, OK, design a mycelium-based product that invites you and requires to be interacted with it to function and encourages you to discard it in nature, which comes as a result of this interaction. She designed a bottle, which she calls second skin, which you can really peel, which really needs to be peeled in order to be used. So she used a level in experience, which is performative level, to emphasize the material that you can really throw it away. So you need to really, really damage and break the material in order to reach to the inside. It has been used as a packaging before that I showed you in a covative example. So they are both packaging. Of course, the technical understanding of the material uh, help us to come up with a packaging solution. But what experience thinking brought is another level, which was about the interaction, which was about a new ritual of packaging, opening a packaging. And here brings me my, the last dimension that I want to really emphasize, which is about temporal performative dimension. So the designer didn't really design something for just now. 
but she really considered what it could be done over time. What will happen? What are the temporal qualities of this material? And how I can really use it? If it will dissolve and if it is good for the ground, why we do things that we don't really encourage people to put it in the ground? So this was exactly our conclusion that we could get from this project. So the foam-like material elicits a sense of familiarity when applied into packaging. So it is like foam-like. Yet a totally novel way of interacting with the material is offered. I would like to conclude with just two ways. So understanding how materials makes us think, feel, and act will provide new avenues to designing products and new materials. This requires integrated understanding of material and product design to push the boundaries of traditional materials development and product design. And my colleagues in RISE actually have been great advocates of this for many years. The designer needs to be synthesized to working with the material in order to fully consider what materials can do as well as what materials want to be. And with material-driven design, we try to understand that, what materials want to be. Thank you. <laughs>